I want to start off with this picture. This is one of the earliest <laughs> pictures from the Glenfiddich distillery, if not the earliest one. We think it's uh, a picture from the early 20th century. And I'll point out a few buildings on that picture. So all these buildings here, these are warehouses. So that's how we think that this picture is from the earliest with, from the early 20th uh, century. In those days, you couldn't really send casks to uh, other distilleries to mature them. If you wanted to mature your whiskey, you had to build a warehouse and mature your whiskey on site. So the distillery would have been going for a few years. The distillery was started in 1887. The buildings here, these are the floor moldings. Again, slightly more difficult back then to start a distillery because if you wanted to start distilling, you also had to malt uh, your own barley. There were no uh, commercial maltsters. So William Grant started malting his own barley. There's also a bottling plant. We were filling bottles back then. We were also filling uh, demijohns or pigs, which we would send to customers. These are big, large uh, bottles, sort of, uh, that customers would send back. We would refill, send back to the pubs. So that would happen in that building here. The distillery itself is this building here. So mashing, fermentation, distillation in three stills, one wash still, the low ones were split into two smaller uh, spirit stills. The next picture I want to share with you is our founder. And I'll summarize his story in just a few words. His story is the story of a man who was in his 40s, he had worked uh, for a local whiskey producer for 20 years, and he wanted to start his own business, so he asked for some help from his children, and he started building his own distillery. And I'm sure some of those points, if not all of those points, will relate to some of you starting distilleries nowadays around the world. And that's the first point that I want to make now. The first point I want to make is, some of the distilleries that are being born today will become the Glenfiddichs of the future. Hopefully, some of you in this room will become the Glenfiddichs of the future. Yeah? <laughs> and it might not take that long, you know, it might not take 100 years. If you look more recently to our history, okay, this is slightly off topic because I'll be talking about gin, but in 2000 we started a gin called Hendrix, Hendrix Gin. In some markets, Hendrix Gin is already bigger than Glenfiddich by value for us. And it won't be long before Glenfiddich is the biggest brand by value again um, for William Grant & Sons in the space of 17 years, which is quite remarkable. And that uh, leads me on to the, the second point, which is why there are two of us from William Grant & Sons in, the, in this room. Where are you, Kevin? Kevin's here. You'll hear from Kevin later. <laughs> um, and that's because over the generations, that feeling of being the underdog, the entrepreneur who's starting up, was passed down the generations. And it's very much in the culture of William Grant & Sons. And we're very keen to support the new distilleries that are starting up. Also, because size is relative, we are definitely much bigger than a lot of the producers in this room. I don't actually think that we're the biggest. Remy, who's represented by Matt, I think uh, as a company, Remy, I think is bigger than, than William Grant & Sons. And if you look at the bigger players, um, two of them in particular are more than 10 times bigger than William Grant & Sons. So when we have meetings and we talk about how we're going to win with some of the things we want to do, the topic of, well, we can't do like the big boys always comes up. So, you know, size is relative and um, we, we certainly feel like an underdog, which uh, I know it was sort of a joke, you know, when you mentioned we can't wait to hear William Grant's response on the topic of the Scotch Whiskey Association, but we don't always agree with the SWA either. Uh, I'll show you an example uh, later, but more recently we had a, a public debate, <laughs> let's call it a debate, uh, with the Scotch Whiskey Association and other members. Uh, this was back in 2008, I think it started. Uh, you'll all remember the, the Cardew story and the pure mold debate. Um, so this is something that we felt strongly against the interest of uh, the Scotch whiskey industry. And so we, we had that public debate, which in the end we won. And I think it shows that you know, a smaller player with the right arguments can win against the the, the bigger players um, at the SWA. But the point on regulations is um, it, it's not a straightforward one. I mean, we heard yesterday many different uh, points of view. And um, 
There's another point that wasn't mentioned, which is uh, the role of emerging markets in those conversations, because you know that's where the growth is coming from for Scotch whisky over the next few years, and the regulations play a big part in how Scotch whisky uh, grows uh, in those markets. And I would say also that the big players now have a vetted interest in protecting the interest of the smaller players. Most of the big players, including ourselves, have now invested in smaller um, uh, companies. So we've heard of uh, Remy and Westland, um, and we've invested in Hudson, Hudson Distillery, uh, a small distillery in the, the New York State. So it's in our interest as well to make sure that the regulations um, protect not just the big brands, but also the emerging uh, companies and the emerging brands. But I'm here today to talk about learning from the past. And there's a particular project that I led. It was a few years ago. It's not a recent project, but I think it's the most relevant uh, to this topic. And this project will take us back to the year 1912. So I'll share the story first, uh, and then I'll, I'll highlight some of the things that we can all learn from what happened back in 1912 and how we've grown the brands over the years. And the story starts with this man. So this is Paul, Paul Kendall. Uh, he uh, was our company archivist. And often when I talk about the company archives, people picture this room with Paul in it, looking at an old book and it's all organized and it's all perfect. And we've got so many um, um, items that we want to keep and that we display that everybody loves. The reality is somehow different, unfortunately. Now we're fixing this. But one of the early mistakes that we made was when it comes to stuff that we want to keep for posterity, we converted an old house between Glenfiddich and Balvenie distilleries and we started dumping stuff into it. <laughs> so all the company records, board meetings, uh, old items, old products, we started putting that in there because we felt we probably should not throw that away, we should keep it. But we never really organized it until we got this man in the company to sort things out. Now, he has a huge workload, as you can imagine. And in 2011, he phoned me because he said I was working on our blended whiskey at the time. I was working on grants. And he said, Ludo, you, you want to come over? I've, um, I've discovered something that you'll want to see. And what he discovered was this book, the blending book number one. This is the oldest record we have of the whiskies which went into our blend, dating back to uh, the earliest record was the 11th of June, 1912. Really interesting, I'll show you the pages in a minute. What I did first of all was I phoned Brian Kinsman, our master blender, uh, just to see if he knew about this book. And Brian, our master blender, did not know that we have this record, so he was very interested in seeing it. We took a look at it and of course, the first thing on our mind was, we've got to have a go at recreating this. It's the obvious thing to do, especially because the year was 2011 and the recipe or the record went back to 1912. So we waited until exactly 100 years later and we invited some of our friends in my new company car. <laughs> and <laughs> now this is actually a, a family member. It was the son-in-law of William Grant who bought this car after William Grant died. And we still have it in the company. Anyway, you recognize some of these faces. I think you were busy that day, Dave, so you couldn't join us, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, we asked these guys to help us. So we went into the blending room in Dufftown at Glenfiddich. And uh, yeah, the idea was the guys would help us blend. But as you can see on the picture, most of them were bloggers and journalists, so they were busy on Twitter and Facebook, and uh, Brian did most of the work. <laughs> but this is what we had to work with. So I know you can't really see it from where you are, but just to show you, it opens up like this, and you have two pages. So we look at the one uh, here, first of all. Can you read from the back? Can you see the names there? Okay, I'll point out some of the most interesting details. So these are the types of casks. So B is a butt, P is a puncheon, hogshead, uh, quarter, and octave. Now this is quite important because that's how we worked out the quantity of each whiskey in the blend. And these are the different single malts and single grains which went uh, in the blend. What Brian was really surprised of was when we worked out this ratio, we noticed that the ratio of malt to grain is very similar to what we use today, two to one, roughly. And also the amount of Speyside whiskey which is the flavor profile that we give our blend today. We want to go for mostly a Speyside style of blended whiskey. 
To achieve that, we use mostly Speyside style uh, single malt whiskies, as you can imagine. Back then, the, the idea was the same. We use mostly Speyside single malt whiskies with some, a little bit of peat, which again is what we do uh, today. The years are also quite interesting. So here you can see when the cask was filled and went into a warehouse, and when we took the cask out of bond for blending. In order for you not to have to work out the ages, <laughs> the next page is actually quite helpful, because that column here lists the ages of the whiskies. Some of the whiskies are as old as 14 years old. Now, that really surprised us. Uh, we really didn't think that back in 1912, the whiskies that went into what was our, our, our most standard blend, if you look at the previous page, Stand Fast, that was the name of Grant's family reserve. So that's the Grant's, the, the standard blend that we were making in those days. So to find out that some of the whiskey was 14 years old was quite surprising. The youngest whiskey was also surprising. The youngest in here is two years. Dave mentioned it, the legislation that said that Scotch whiskey needs to be matured for initially a minimum of two years, and then three years. That came a few years later in 1916, I think, yeah. Uh, so back then, uh, whiskey did not need to be matured. But the average age for our blend was already a big surprise for us six years and one month. That surprised Brian because what he's trying to achieve today is an apparent uh, age for his blend of between five to seven years. So bang on what we were making back in 1912. The next challenge for us was filtration. Because when we look at old bottles of grants, not that old, we don't have bottles of whiskey that are that, are that old, uh, by the way, more from the, I think it starts from the 1930s. When we look at old bottles of Grants from the 1930s, they were bottled at 70 degrees proof. That's the old Gay-Lussac strength, which is 40% alcohol. And the whiskey is clear, like it was chilled filtered. Now clearly, it wasn't chilled filtered all those years ago. So that puzzled uh, Brian and myself. We weren't sure how that was achieved. So we started asking around in the business. Nobody really knew what the answer was. We asked other people in the industry. Again, nobody really knew. Eventually, we asked Charles Gordon, who was our life president, the great grandson of William Grant. He was in his 80s at the time. He's passed away since. And Charles said, well, I remember as a child, the uh, guys at the distillery were filtering whiskey with egg white. And that sort of rang a bell, and I, I think it happens in other industries as well. The problem was we had no idea how to do it. It's one thing to say, oh, yeah, yeah, they were filtering with egg white, but how do you actually uh, do it? So we asked our technical team to look at it. Uh, how do you filter whiskey with egg white? So they started breaking eggs, <laughs> collecting the white from eggs, and playing with how much whiskey do you add? Do you add water first? Do you mix the egg with the whiskey at full strength, how long do you wait? And it turns out that if you take the content of one egg and you mix it with about 20 liters of whiskey at, at full strength, you mix it, so that's the hard part, you have to mix it quite hard, wait for two weeks. The next picture I have is not, it's unfortunately the best one I have and it shows you what happens. This is a lab sample that we did, but the, um, some of the egg uh, will start floating to the top, some will sink to the bottom, and the whiskey that stays in the middle is clear. It actually works. It's a very messy process, probably similar to you know, what you were describing yesterday with that glue. Um, so it's a messy process, but it actually works. And we did this for 100 liters, 100 bottles, so it wasn't quite 100 liters, but we filled uh, 100 bottles, and we recreated 100 bottles. That was an interesting conversation with the SWA, actually, because if you look at the old pack, that does not satisfy the current standards of the Scotch Whiskey Association. So I was trying to use the traditional argument, you know, that they were throwing at you yesterday. Um, I was saying, but it is traditional. They, they were saying, yeah, it's too traditional <laughs> because the, uh, the, the legislation has moved on. And I had that conversation with our, our legal team as well. Uh, the, the obvious thing that's missing there is what type of Scotch whiskey is it? All it says there is Scotch whiskey. In those days, that's all it said. 
you could only buy blended whiskey. There was no single malt market as there is today. So all scotch was blended and therefore you just called your whiskey scotch whiskey. They had issues with the strength as well. We couldn't put 70 degrees on the bottle. It had to be 40%. Uh, they also asked us to add uh, a note on the back label that says may contain egg in case of egg allergies, okay, fine, I won't fight that battle. The one thing that they also said you can't have on the label is on the back, there actually was a label on the bottle from the, the 1930s that we have, and it says, uh, distilled under the supervision of qualified doctors, which is true, two of William Grant's sons uh, were doctors, so that's fair enough. And the next bit said, and therefore it can be recommended for um, family use and uh, <laughs> medicinal purposes. <laughs> so, yeah, I didn't even fight that battle. You know, I knew that we could not put that on the label. So they gave us a little bit of flexibility, such as with the name, because we never sold uh, this stuff. We made 100 bottles, mostly for posterity. Most of it is in the company archives. I drank quite a bit of it with friends as well, just to show what it was like. And um, I'm afraid there is none left. That's why you didn't taste it yesterday. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's why, because it wasn't a commercial product, we could get away with not having all these mentions that we should have uh, nowadays. So, what did I learn from uh, this, this project? And what are the learnings that, um, if you're starting a new distillery, you should take out of this project? The learnings I'm going to share apply to you if you are starting a distillery just to make a living for you and your family, or if you're starting a distillery in order to um, work and pos possibly sell your business to a bigger company, or indeed create a five-generation family business like William Grant did. The first one is the importance of staying ahead of legislation. And I actually changed that this morning because of the conversation we had yesterday. Even though it wasn't a legal requirement to mature whiskey for two years, uh, William Grant was already doing that back then. And that was really helpful because when the legislation came, he already had uh, stock maturing and he could easily cope with the legislation. There are examples in our history when legislation change did not work in our favor, particularly when we had this debate with the Scotch Whiskey Association over the names uh, and the categories of Scotch whiskey. That really affected our business in Taiwan. Taiwan was a big uh, blended malt market, which in those days was called pure malt. And the word pure was more valued by consumers there than the word single. And the pure malt uh, category was a lot, lot bigger than single malt. The problem is when we changed the wording from pure to blended, consumers did not understand the word blended. We had to do a lot of work to educate the consumers there and eventually to explain you know, what a single malt is and that's really helped the single malt category. But for our blended malt business, in 20, um, 2008, I think it was, uh, we were selling 11,000 cases of Grant's blended malt uh, in Taiwan. That's 130,000 bottles a year. Nowadays, we sell nothing. We don't sell any blended malt anymore in Taiwan. So that's a change of legislation which has completely killed a part of our business. So especially for those of you starting in markets where there are not so many regulations or even in places where regulations might change, it's really worth thinking about, do I continue doing what I'm doing the way I'm making it, even though I know that the legislation is going to change and I'm prepared to fight, but I could lose that battle? Or do you quickly adapt and make sure that your business can survive post legislation changes? The second thing I learned is never a priority for any new business. But it's so important, and that's to invest in your company archives. Really important. It will save money in the long term. I don't know if you can read, but I'll, I'll read the, the words for you. Uh, it will save um, uh, money in the long term because you know the archivists that we have now, we have our, our second archivist now, they're, they're very busy trying to make sense of everything that we saved and trying to date all the documents and, and so on. Um, also, it protects your legacy. You know, Yasmin, the story you shared of your father yesterday, you know, full of emotion, that is worth a lot of money to, to consumers. And it's so important to protect that so that a hundred years from now, that story lives on and it can be used to tell the story of, of your business and, and your brand. It adds value because 
this project, okay, we didn't turn it into a commercial opportunity, but we, we could have turned it into a commercial uh, product. So the fact that we had those records helped us generate money for the business. But also, if your ambition is to sell your business onto a bigger company, uh, you know, we will be looking at these things. You know, we're, we're always looking for new um, companies to partner with. Certainly, one of the things that we're looking at is not just current sales, but also, well, what is the brand story? And what have you got to back that brand story? Do you have documents that we can use? What are your archives like? It also allows you to learn from previous mistakes and successes. So the egg white filtration, surely there's a better way of doing it than what we did. But unfortunately, we've lost all that and we're not sure exactly how we did it on a larger scale. And the importance of future proofing technology. That's because nowadays, I think we all think with the internet and Facebook and YouTube, it's all out there and it will be there forever. And I actually read an interesting article about how we're currently generating a, a, a black hole of um, human history because paper stays for generations and decades, if not centuries. Current technology evolves and it's very easy to lose stuff. Do you remember those? <laughs> My presentation would not fit on those floppy disks. And I'm sure the same story happened to you. I had a computer, I used floppy disks, and then I bought a new computer, and then I couldn't use my floppy disk anymore. And I wasn't good at labeling the floppy disks. And eventually I thought, what was in there? Eventually I started using the floppy disks as coasters. It's quite handy, for cups of coffee, but it fits on there. Eventually you think, oh, gosh, I have no idea. You move house and you put it in the bin, not knowing exactly what was on it. And there might have been interesting documents or pictures from the past that you should have kept for your business. And that's where an archivist can help you make sure that the important stuff is kept in a way that will last for a long time. And it's not just hardware, but software. I know I have some pictures from, and I only started at Glenfiddich uh, 17 years ago, which is not that long ago, but I already have a file full of pictures. I know they're pictures, but I can't open them. And <laughs> I'm sure I could pay a service somewhere for someone to convert them into the right uh, format now. But if I don't know what they are, I'm just thinking, oh, just delete them, it's easier. And you could lose really valuable uh, information and evidence that you could use in the future to, or that your children could use in the future to, to grow your brand. And the final one is about consistency. And I really wanted to mention that one because there was a comment yesterday about how, uh, it, uh, I, maybe I misunderstood the comment, it sounded like uh, consistency is the opposite of quality and that the two are incompatible. Now, I completely disagree with that because uh, you know, I don't think anybody gets up in the morning to consistently make bad whiskey or bad spirit, wh whatever that spirit is. Uh, we try to make something good and then we find a way to consistently make it good. Uh, somebody mentioned yesterday, you, know, you need quality because people will buy your bottle once and if it's not good, they won't buy it twice. If it is good, they will buy it twice. But if it's not consistent, they won't buy it a third time. So consistency is very important. And not just in the way it's made, which we've seen with uh, the Grants blend, which is remarkable how, okay, it has evolved a little bit over the years, of course, but it's remarkable how consistent it has remained over, uh, over 100 years. Um, it's also important to be consistent in the, the, the brand messages uh, that you use. And for that, I think it's important to think about the long term, because something that we love uh, in our company, big or small, is to talk about small scale. So we have small batches uh, in, our, in our company. That's how we sort of play the, the small card. If you're a smaller producer, it's of course much easier to play that card. Consumer love that. The problem is, is it scalable? So as your business grows, will you be able to use that message. Because again, when we're looking to invest in a smaller company, if they use a message that works for the small scale that they're at, but doesn't allow them to grow, then you know, it means that we need to reinvent the brand story. And will it still be compelling for consumers? I'm not quite sure. So the message needs to be consistent and stand the test of time. Same with packaging. But it's also important to be brave when things are too generic. And I'll show you what we did for our packaging. So this is how the Grants bottle has evolved over the years. Apologies for the picture, I just took it in um, the visitor center before I left. Um, but hopefully you can see, so that's the, the, the original bottle, which hardly changed for about 50 years. In those days, marketing was pretty much non-existent and everybody used, almost everybody used, a fairly generic bottle for their blend. 
And at that point, we felt it's too generic. We need to uh, change and have a different shape and a distinctive uh, pack. So that's when the triangular bottle was introduced in 1956. But if you look at the evolution of the pack from 1956, it's definitely recognizable over the space of 60, 60 odd years. So be brave uh, and change things when they're too generic, but then try and be consistent with your, with your message. And a final thought uh, before I go, which is still on the topic of learning from the past. I'll leave you with one quote, which we found in, in the company archives, in the uh, travel journal that Charles Gordon, who was William Grant's son-in-law, in 1909, he traveled around the world to promote his father's whiskey. He was uh, launching Grant's whiskey in, in new markets. And he had a travel journal where, where he captured loads of different thoughts. And he wrote a quote I don't know who it's from. I don't think it's from him. Uh, but he wrote that quote in his uh, journal. He wrote, None cease to rise, but those who cease to climb. Everything must yield to industry and time. Now, I'm sure he believed in that, otherwise he wouldn't have uh, written it down. But I very much doubt that he thought that his business, four generations on, would be as successful as it is today. So. I really hope that you know, all of you in this room 100 years from now have a business that's become as successful as the one that William Grant built uh, all those years ago. And um, I want to thank you for your time and best of luck indeed. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you, Ludo. Uh, very fascinating uh, uh, speech there. And I think you know, a couple of things that come out of that for me, uh, long term, you know, we are in a long term business. Uh, you know, I, I often get frustrated with, with uh, some producers uh, kind of rushing things out, putting out whiskies, which aren't hitting peak maturity. Uh, you know, we're in a long term business. Sometimes you just have to take the financial hit and you have to think, well, actually, you know what? we're building for the future and whiskey takes time and, and time is important and respecting time and understanding time and what happens over time is vitally important. I'm delighted you began talking about archivists and archives as well. You know, I've done a fair amount of work on fake whiskies and it's interesting to, no, not, not making fake whiskies, <laughs> you know, uh, but you're know, researching into them and it's, it's fascinating uh, and worrying to see that the companies who have been most badly affected by, by uh, fake whiskies are the ones who got rid of their archives. So, so I know it might seem daft for new, new startups to establish an archive when you've only been going a few years, but really, uh, just to underline what Ludo is saying, it's so, so important to, to keep control of your brand and establish your own heritage. Uh, we have got, I've just rambled on there, sorry. Uh, we have got time for probably just one question here. Uh, we kind of a little bit pushed for time. Uh, any questions from this? You're very quiet today. You hung over or something. <laughs> uh, just one from me then, Ludo. <laughs> You're right. not going away that easily. You know, I mean, everybody has to have a question. Uh, and I think it's just one on, on perspective. You know, uh, how important uh, in terms of brand building uh, and maybe even just reassurance within the company is having that perspective uh, in, in, in innovation and in taking the company forward. Yeah, I think... You know, uh, is it a liberating thing rather than a restrictive thing? Or something? There's, um, there's an expression that the family members often use when they talk to employees and, um, or to customers, which is that they, they stand on the shoulders of those who came before them. And the shareholders, the, the family members, are definitely obsessed with doing better than the previous generation. So they look at what the previous generation achieved and they've done an awful lot. Uh, and so they think, okay, now it's our turn and our job is to grow the business and do more than the previous generation did so that we can pass it on to the next generation. And so that perspective um, gives you confidence, you know, that if the previous four generations have done it, there's no reason why the fifth one could not do it. But at the same time, it puts a lot of pressure as well on, uh, on, on responsibility on, on the business now. <laughs>
Thank you. So, sorry, we there's only, only only time for one. I also uh, I really appreciated that very subtle pitch that you know William Grant is always looking to enter into <laughs> partnership with new distillers. So you know, uh, apply at the door later on. You know, <laughs> Ludo, thank Listen, you very much indeed. Cheers. We'll see you later on. Thanks.